Well, without further ado, I want to have Ms. Armita come on up. Try that again. Testing, thank you so much. Good morning, thank you so much for coming so early this morning. And I'm very honored to have having this opportunity to be in front of you today. Thank you to FDRS for this opportunity to be speaking to you this morning. So the title of my presentation today is How Yoga Helps the Lymphatic System. And basic principles when establishing a yoga-based exercise program to enhance lymphatic flow. I'll just move this up a little. I have, I have no disclosures. So just to briefly review what the definition of yoga is, it's derived from the Sanskrit word Yug, which also means to unite or integrate. And yoga is a 5,000-year-old Indian body of knowledge. It's all about harmonizing the body with the mind and the breath, which is really the key component here, which I'll be emphasizing quite a bit today. There are also ways of doing yoga through the means of various breathing exercises, <coughs> yoga poses, which are often called asanas, and meditation. It's a comprehensive system for well-being on all levels, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. While yoga is often equated with hatha yoga, which is the well-known system of postures and breathing techniques, it's only a part of the overall discipline of yoga. Today, many millions of people use various aspects of yoga to help raise their quality of life in such diverse areas as fitness, stress relief, wellness, vitality, mental clarity, healing, peace of mind, and spiritual growth. I have a very basic slide of the lymphatic system just to review. Um, I may not have a, I don't think I have a pointer, but I will just review that briefly. So upon looking at the lymph vessel system, and we spoke about the lymphatics at length yesterday. For those of you um, who have been here, I know that taking care of your lymphatic system is part of your self-care. Just to review that it is a system of vessels and lymphatic tissue, including lymph nodes, and it's found through most parts of the body. In the diagram, the lymph nodes are the darker, deeper circles that we see. And often we know that they can be found in certain strategic parts of the body. We may be most familiar with the ones that are in the axilla, in the groin, but there are deep lymph nodes as well that line in the deepest part of our trunks as well. And you can see that in some of the, in the picture. Unlike our blood circulatory <coughs> system, the lymph system is a one-way highway of fluid transportation, which is other than blood. And a well-functioning lymph system is important in maintaining health, removing waste and pathogens, as well as fluid balance. So our initial lymphatic vessels, which are immediately located underneath our superficial layer of our skin. When we move and do light body work or move our tissues where our skin is getting an opportunity to move, when we pump our muscles, these initial lymphatic vessels get a chance to twist open and their channels open up and the lymph can flow into their channels. From here, they go into the deeper vessels towards the lymph nodes using its own pumping system. The lymphatics have their own pumping system. The lymph vessel system carries excess water, proteins, and waste from the connective tissue and the fascia back to the bloodstream. During the transportation process, the lymph is cleaned, filtered, concentrated. Many immune reactions occur in the lymph <coughs> nodes, and if the pathways become congested, blocked, damaged, or severed, then fluids can build up in the connective tissue, leading to edema and fibrosis. Eventually, cell pathology may begin, and if there is damage in the connective tissue, such as burns, chronic inflammation, ulceration, or hematoma, then 
lymph vessel system must transport the damaged cells, inflammatory products, and toxins away from the area. The quicker that this can happen, the faster the recovery will be. And the description that I obtained is from the Dr. Vodder School, the school of training where myself and my assistant Catherine, who will come up later on, we are trained under the Dr. Vodder School of Manual Lymphatic Drainage. <clears throat> Some of the principles to understand with, and I'll, I'll switch and come back. Um, with lymphatic therapeutic exercise, which will encompass lymph drainage and actual distribution of hydration, one of the most key principles of this type of exercise and it would be ideal if it was with most exercises, is the deep diaphragmatic breathing work, which I will demonstrate while we're doing our session, but I think it's worthwhile to at least get an understanding of how that works now. So with our belly, we can take a large deep breath through the deep abdominals, where the deep abdominals below the belly button can expand, taking that deep breath, filling up the entire cavity, and then exhaling, pressing in gently to expel all of that air. And this expansive opening and closing of the trunk of the, the deeper parts of our cavity of this body that can draw in the um, pressure gradient that we want to create to pump the lymphatic fluid through. Because if you look at the, if you see where from the legs, the lymph nodes are are coming through from the hips and they conjoin right at the, around the belly button region where you see a dark, deep kind of a oval in the middle. That's our cisterna chile. So when we take that deep breath, that confluence of all the lymph that results in creating the cisterna chile gets pumped and squeezed, opening and closing, pushing in, releasing, creating a pump. And then the abdominal part of the thoracic duct is the next one where the fluid can be pumped up towards. And as it goes upwards towards the venous angle, the lymph, excuse me, we are bringing the lymphatic fluid up towards the circulatory system. <clears throat> Once it reaches the venous angles, this fluid can now enter the circulatory system through the venous system it actually dumps in, is what I call it. And that fluid now is taken to the heart and pumped to the kidneys, where it is filtered and processed out. So if you've ever had something like manual lymphatic drainage done, you may have experienced an increased need to use the washroom to urinate to remove that fluid. It's extremely powerful and effective. By doing these types of exercises where we also enhance lymphatic flow, you may also get these enhanced results. <clears throat> Some other principles that are important with this type of therapeutic exercise, we start proximally with the core because we want to expand and contract the body to create the pumping mechanism to allow the lymphatic flow to be enhanced and flow. <coughs> we repeat the movements with breath, typical principles that I enjoy using when I'm teaching yoga or yoga type of exercise or yoga fusion is with expansion we inhale the breath and with flexion or closure we exhale and let that pumping mechanism that opening and closing of the body provide that full oxygenation full tissue opening and also enhancing the ability for the lymphatics to take on that pumping um, um, action the exercises, this is very important. Low impact, slow. Don't ever be in a hurry when going into what you feel is full available range, when, especially when you first start the movement. You have plenty of times, usually a few repetitions, to progressively move into the available range that you have. And we must be protective of our, of our range of motion. So yoga is for everyone. It is not only for those that look like Cirque du Soleil on the covers of certain magazines, okay? If you have breath, you can do yoga. I want to make that very clear. Yoga was always designed to be inclusive. 
and it was a, it is and was initially so many centuries ago developed as a means and a way of conducting one's life. It was a guide and principles. Nice things that we can do during our yoga sessions, rebounding, oscillating movements, vibratory movements, the gravitational pull caused by bouncing. I've used even balls, Swiss balls to sit on while I'm doing my yoga practice. You don't have to have any props at all. You can use your body, you can use your limbs to move in a fluidic, bouncy, vibratory fashion, oscillating fashion, which we'll get to experience later on. And what that does, it allows those one-way lymphatic vessels and valves to open and close, moving the limb. Fascial stretching. Uh, my presentation talks a lot about the fascia and the relationship of the fascia with the lymphatics and our autonomic nervous system was amazing because when I did this presentation, I prepared it independently and to come here yesterday and experience the conversation <coughs> of how all those systems are so interconnected. It further reinforces um, how important to understand just some of these basics. The so fascial stretching on elongating movements, you will see that is also a very important part and a typical aspect of yoga movement. Some of the rest of the um, principles are very commonplace to most exercise programs. There's muscle compression, creating a squeeze and soak effect when we contract and then expand. It's like squeezing a sponge, all the contents come out, releasing the sponge where the pumping of the fluid comes back in and flushing out the system and those contractile tissues. We also move in a variety of planes and directions to push hydration to all the tissues by doing such pumping action. Increased heart rate moves blood and breath. Frequent movement to prevent stagnation. Sufficient rest to rehydrate tissues after workout, which typically dehydrates or wrings out the tissue. So this is also important. Sometimes I think that some, we are often immersed in a cultural mindset, perhaps that we have to do things a lot to get results. And even too much exercise can be very difficult on our tissues if you don't rec allow for recovery. If you have permission to recover, you have permission to nurture yourself and go with your gut on these types of decisions that you make. The movement of the fascia may cause an emotional response because the connections of the fascia with all the other tissues are likely neurogenic. And this was discovered by um, our father of osteopathic medicine, A.T. Still. Very interesting. So you may have an emotional release. Do not be afraid of that. You may be a little bewildered at first if something like that occurs because when you're releasing the tissues, you may have tears come out. You might want to sneeze. You may want to be coughing. You might just take a deep sigh and go into deep relaxation. You may have to go to the bathroom. And that's great because it's all a release. So what is um, how are fascia and fluid flow connected? The fascia, or it's otherwise known as the loose connective tissue, surrounds all organs, all muscles, cells, and the consistency includes cells itself. Fibroblasts are the builders of our um, fascial and, and fibers of our body. Um, there may be tumor cells. We're battling that all the time. There's stuff in, in our system and our body can be hopefully strong enough to counter. Therefore, the immune cells are there and the adipocytes. Collagen fibers provide the 3D scaffolding for our blood vessels to move their way through and to stay in place. And elastin microfibrils are also in existence. Large amounts of ground substance, uh, which may be an amorphous material. Hyaluron is part of, and hyaluronic acid is part of that makeup. And the interstitial fluid, which definition is the fluid that exists between cells and tissue. <coughs> so this is a bit of a busy slide. I'm just going to uh, share with you just the lower part. The loose connective tissue um, can hold the majority of the body's 15-liter interstitial fluid, which is also known as extracellular fluid. 
normal blood plasma volume is about three liters, and six to 10 liters of fluid pass through the lymph system every day, turning over the extra um, cellular fluid every 48 hours. What a dynamic process that we live through every single day. <laughs> There's not a dull moment in our bodies. Okay, and the quotes from A.T. Still, just briefly. He is the father of osteopathic me medicine. This quote came from an article that was written in the late 19th century. Um, and when it comes to A.T. Still and Gray, the anatomist, they really had an amazing vision of what they could find and see. And sometimes some of those, that information that they have attained may have been lost or maybe overshadowed by some other um, uh, findings in medicine. And, and we're kind of going back to that. So uh, Gray was excellent in portraying the anatomy of the fascia in his earlier works, which are some very difficult to find today. A.T. Still says, the fascia sheets permeates, divides, subdivides every portion of all animal bodies and surrounding and penetrating every muscle and all its fibers, every artery and every fiber. The fascia functions by secreting and excreting vital fluid, excreting fluid, sorry, vital and destructive. By its action we live and by its failure we shrink, swell and die. So I have a video to show you, um, which I will just start here. And this video um, is by Ed Kane, who has compiled it through Jean-Claude Guillain-Barteau, who has been able to film the fascia now, a grapefruit is a good example underneath of the skin. So we'll cue up the video to um, once we get a in minute, here, I what think is all this stuff, I think, as well four seconds. at now, there we go. these images are recorded, were recorded of the living human fascia. This shape represents the kind of three-dimensional structure. As you can see deeply into the fascia, this is strolling under the skin by Dr. Jean-Claude Guimbarteau. When you see the behavior of the fascia under some pressure, you start to understand how it is moving. Watch as the fascia, tendrils of the fascia, move. Imagine elasticity, surface tension, flow, and movement. The shape of these quadrahedrons are multi-layered. Look at this. Amazing. The elasticity is the first component. Obviously it can move and stretch. But also, notice how the fibrils can move along another fibril. Its cross-linking is partly normal and partly uh, abnormal, partly. But you'll see this free flow. Look at this. You'd like see to the see way the blood vessels intertwine. That a tubule of myofascia moves in this rendering. Now watch as you see the tendril move along another. Now think of a membrane spreading and splitting. Observe how it separates. Now it can actually rejoin later on. The splitting is what we think of as the myofascial release. This amazing lattice here in this computer depiction, how it is all enmeshed and entwined in a fractal chaos. And here, the rendering of two tubules separating, for instance. See how the fascia is in constant motion, responding to our every movement, allowing every flexibility of the tissues, movement of muscles, movement of the body, joints, everything articulating and allowing this free movement. Watch again as it separates. Now, 
there is this conduction, this idea of the tubule as it conducts water. See this? As the water passes through a tubule of myofascia. The yellow that you see is Amazing. tissue. This is just to give you an idea of how the body in constant motion is responding to the myofascial release is performed by by a therapist as they help you to release this cross-linking. Look at this area of densely packed fascia. This is the structure of life. And we can stop the video here. Thank you, gentlemen. Microvacuoles. So I'll advance the slide. If it lets me. Oh, I get to skip over to. Okay. So I think the video is amazing. <laughs> the footage, that's what's happening in your system. And you can visualize that. It gives you encouragement to say, I can, I'm going to take care of myself because this is what's happening inside of me. And sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't have to be as complex as we think. So hydration is very important, movement is very important, breath is very important. At this time, I'll just briefly go over the fact that the deep fascia is highly vascular, um, with superficial and deep layers, each rich with vascular network of capillaries, venules, arterioles, and lymphatic channels. The mast cells suggest a protective role set like other connective tissues, and the deep layer has few elastin fibers but has myofibroblasts, so suggesting that it itself also can be contractile. Now, <clears throat> therapies to reduce lymphedema, which those of us perhaps have had some long-standing history with lipedema or Durkheim's may have secondary lymphedema. So, to reduce the lymphedema, we must take into account that there is increased tissue compliance, which was mentioned yesterday, or is otherwise known as overstretching, of the interstitial matrix. So you saw the matrix in the video. Everything gets fluffed out and expanded. All organs, or, and also compressed, too, because of the fluid that's on board. All organs, muscles, and body structures must be viewed in the context of the surrounding uh, connective tissues and distant blood and lymphatic flow. Now we'll talk about actual yoga and fluid flow. So the mechanical stresses of the yoga movement and pressure gradients are needed to maintain function in all living tissues. And in soft tissues, interstitial flow is primarily di driven by plasma leaving the capillaries. And we found out yesterday that by the time we get to the capillaries, whatever fluid is um, driven out is absorbed 100% by the lymphatics. <clears throat> that pressure gradient, in turn, is affected by large movements of the skeletal system, smaller motion from the arterial pulsation, respiration, which is breathing, organ motion. Yes, our organs actually move within our system. And this slow interstitial flow, the flow that's between all cells of fluid, have a direct mechanical effect on the cells nearby and transporting proteins and other components of the biomechanical environment. We talk about the yoga and the autonomic nervous system. So the next three slides are really the highlights here. And if you'd like to take a photograph, this will be a good one because it really kind of summarizes where yoga comes in. So yogic breathing is a unique method for balancing the autonomic nervous system, influencing, as we know, smooth muscle system, and influencing psychologic and stress-related disorders. Specific breathing techniques can alleviate anxiety, depression, everyday stress, post-traumatic stress, stress-related medical illnesses. Mechanisms mm -hmm. contributing to a state of calm alertness include increased parasympathetic drive, calming the stress response system, neuroendocrine release of hormones, and thalamic generators. The benefits of your yoga-based exercise continue with fascial stretching in various directions, fluid flow in different directions to all the tissues, detoxification, quietened, sympathetic and strengthened parasympathetic nervous systems, autonomic nervous system balancing, reduced stress levels of hormone cortisol, 
and stress reduction and increased relaxation. Continuing, deep postural muscle work and increased tone. This is huge because the body, if we are fortunate enough to have a body where we can at least sit, postural work is something that must be emphasized. Increased body awareness, increased happy and relaxation neurotransmitters, yes, they do exist, and improved sense of well-being, and an increased compliance and likelihood to continue regular exercise once started. At this time, I'm going to ask Catherine to start making her way up to the stage, and Catherine will be my um, assistant during this session here. The next slide, too, is something that, um, which I will queue up to number 26. So these are my little personal quotes, and you're more than welcome to take a photograph of that. And the body is meant to move and breathe. You can drink all the water you want, but unless you move, it won't get distributed as well as it could in the fascia. If you work out tissues, they actually dehydrate. So just rest in between to allow tissue to rehydrate. If you have breath, and I said this earlier, you can do yoga. Yoga is not an exclusive, inclusive, exclusive practice. It is meant to be an inclusive practice. All you need is your breath. You already, you're already breathing. <laughs> so just focus on deepening that, deepening that breath. And so don't compartmentalize. Combine and connect instead, in which that means you can bring in and create a confluence of some of the other knowledge that you may already have. If you know other exercise types, other um, areas of health that you can pull in during your practice, please go ahead and combine and connect. And then add a twist, especially distally. So when you see me, I may be doing some kind of flows, it looks like some exotic movements, and there's a reason to look so you know, good up here, right? It's really to get the fascia at the very ends of our fascial lines to to feel that gentle pull all the way through. So both my girls do Indian classical dance, so they get a chance to do their mudras and the finger movements, which are part of, some people call it yoga for the hands, but there's also a very scientific principle behind that too, which is a whole other um, presentation. But feel free to just move and flow and circulate and round, and you can do it while you're here, and don't hesitate to move your body in these beautiful, flowing movements. We do not move like robots. We're not planner, we're not in plane. We are in rotational movements, diagonal movements, okay? Respect your available range of motion. We learned that with lipedema, hypermobility may be an issue. Safety first, okay? That's the PT, that's the therapist in me telling you, safety first, okay? You can definitely be participating in any program your gut instinct will say, let me start here. And the key is that there's nothing more important than your safety. And even repeated movements, doing it maybe in not the most supported way can lead to a possible injury down the road. So the goal is also, and I know Catherine will mention that, find an instructor that will go gently with you <coughs> and respect your body. So Catherine, if you'd like to come up and speak, let me see if this, I can give you my mic, I think. Can we turn this mic on to Catherine just to speak, if possible, please? Thank you, Sarmita. Hi, I'm Catherine Thrift. I live here in Dallas. And I was medically diagnosed in 1986 with lipedema and have been living with it successfully for more than 30 years. In fact, I've even improved over the years, primarily due to receiving manual lymph drainage doing water walking and with qigong and yoga. I did my yoga in the 20s, in my 20s, in my 30s, totally forgot about it in my 40s, and then started back in my 50s. When I started back, I had three goals in mind. One, to be able to get up and down off the floor reasonably gracefully. <laughs> Two, to be able to lie flat on my back without any pillows underneath my knees, and three, to do more than three minutes at a time without having to stop and rest. I was able to do that 
and accomplish all three goals within about six weeks. But the fact is that I was thinking about teaching my own yoga class, and I was going to entitle it, Big Girls Can Do Yoga Too. So I would say to you, give yoga a try. Thank you. Give yoga a try, and don't be discouraged. Find a great yoga teacher who will encourage you to listen to your body and not force you to do everything that everyone else is doing. Yoga is about honoring your body at this moment in time. So Armita is going to lead us in several poses in addition to the breathing exercises. Do what you can and what you can't, envision them in your mind until you can do them. There's no rush. Progress is moving forward beyond where you are today. Since I do have lipedema, I must modify some of this, the movements that, and the poses that uh, Sarmita is going to show you. Sometimes I have to move the girls out of the way. And many times I have to lift my belly out of the way. But it's just to show you some of the ways that you too can modify. So let's do some yoga. So before we start, I just want to, oh, I have to move to the next slide briefly. I also want to just tell you a little bit about my relationship with Catherine. Catherine is my mentor for, um, and, and, and these slides that I have here, there's so many. I try to create a reference of my, pres to make my presentation so it could be referential. Um, I am happy to share the presentation with whoever would like. This is such an expansive area and you can't cover it all. So I have some material about the breath work and some other principles that are there in yoga. But I made a slide specifically for our conference today because we want to go ahead and give you a few tips and um, some parameters that may be helpful for you for doing yoga or any exercise for the bigger body. So Catherine is my instructor from the Dr. Vodder School of Manual Lymphatic Drainage. And she has been such an integral part of my life and my teachings. And she was present at, <laughs> while I was trying to give birth to my second child. <laughs> and I'm telling you, with the breath work, and this is, um, she's now, yeah. So this is over 14 years ago, my, my baby. And I, she was in feel distress because of the contractions that were happening a little bit premature. And Catherine entered the room. And I said, Catherine, I just want to breathe. I want you to be close to me. And let's just breathe together. And I kid you not, I took maybe it was four or five minutes and Catherine was present and her presence was so important. And that breath of just relaxing and I was visualizing what I wanted to happen at that time. I wanted things to calm down. I wanted things to neutralize, normalize. And the OB stated, she goes, everything is fine now after about four or five minutes of the breath work. And she goes, that's really divine intervention. And I was very honored for her to recognize that. Um, sometimes you have to go within yourself. There's so much power already built inside of you. Sometimes we just have to unlock it. And with the breath work, we can at least start going in that direction. So this is a practice that I would encourage you to consider. And if nothing else, just breathe. So let's get started. I have a little music. If you can't hear it, it's just for all of us to enjoy, and if not, then at least me to, <laughs> to help move with you. So I'll just turn it on. If it comes through the mic, that's, that's a bonus. And when I teach my sessions, I prep a little bit, but honestly, I actually let it come through me. I, uh, it's hard to follow a script. I, I kept one here, but I actually try to visualize and move with the energy that's in the room. So give yourself enough space to perhaps where you can move and sit comfortably if you are at liberty to be in an upright posture without having to lean into the chair. 
that's a big bonus. I'm actually going to remove my shoes. That's typically what I do with my practice. And it's not necessary for everyone, OK? But the key here is ideally, if depending on the length of your legs, if you're able to put feet flat on the floor, it gives you a sense of stability. And what we'll first work on is the breath, always. Just to center ourselves. And we have heard this before. Taking three deep breaths can be an amazing um, shift of our energy centers. Let's go ahead, if we can, and place our hands, if you are able, to place them on your lower abdomen. So if your navel is here, gently place the fingers on the lower abdomen if you're able to reach around and hug. Press in very gently so you feel a little resistance on that soft tissue. When you inhale, allow the body to expand and see if you can bring the air into that lower abdomen so it feels like it's expanding. Big belly. And when you exhale, it's okay to put gentle pressure on the abdomen and if you see me, I'm rolling down very gently as I expel that air. This pumping action of the inhale, raising my chest, allowing the filling in of the air of my lower abdomen, expanding, and then as I exhale, opening the mouth, fogging the mirror is completely allowed. Let's try this. Since we're in a morning practice, we want to be nice and alert and awake. We will get to relax. Inhale, rolling the eyes upwards towards the sun or the ceiling, towards the light expanding the body and exhale if you take longer inhales in the early parts of the day highly oxygenating in comparison to your exhale in the evenings you actually take longer exhales in relation to your inhale rolling the eyes up in the head towards the ceiling and then exhale and at least three to four repetitions and feel if you feel a little more rejuvenated, a little more alive just to get started. Things are flowing. Once we have completed our expansion, we're ready now to address the lymphatics. So those of us are able to use our hands, find out where your pinky fingers are, the padding of the hands. You can warm up the hands by placing them to the heart center and just pressing the squishy parts of the hands, the palms, creating some friction, generating some heat. Inhaling and exhaling as you move. With your next inhale, place the pinky fingers right underneath your earlobe. Okay, I have earrings on, so you can see me. I can shine it up for you. And what we can do with our next inhale, we will stretch the skin back towards the back of the room. Okay, so it's going in this direction. I'm going to exaggerate. With the exhale, stretch the skin down towards the collarbones. So with skin stretching is literally that. It's almost as though you put on Velcro and you just happen to attach your hands to the skin. There is no pressure, so to speak. You're not pushing in. You're stretching the skin back behind you and then down to the collarbone. With the breath, you can both move the arms or the hands and your body. So when you inhale, remember the expansion, moving the hands back. When you exhale, the hands can move down to the collarbone and your body can flow downwards. Inhaling through the nose is permissible if you have enough opening in your sinuses. And then exhaling through the mouth or through the nose. And then another deep inhale again. And then exhaling. And typically we may want to do five repetitions in one location, moving our hands down a little bit more to the lower part of the neck if you have space or just staying where you are and doing another five for the purpose of our sample today. We'll do about another three more. Inhaling, stretching the skin back, expanding the body. If you want to get a little bit fun and creative with it, and if you have the range of motion, open up your wings. And then exhale, bring those wings down and pull your body down gently. Inhale, expansion, roll the eyes up. And then exhaling. And refresh yourself. Inhale, lift. Cleansing, visualizing what you're doing here. Exhale and release and place the hands on the heart center. If you have a larger belly and the hand has to rest, the wrist or the heels of the hand have to rest on the belly, you can do so. 
From here, we will start moving through where we'll get some neck motion. At this time, if you wish, the hands can be resting on the thighs. If it's more comfortable, depending on the space that you have to rest the hands on the belly, you can do so. Sometimes even just hands on heart center can give you a sense of um, erect posture. Neck motion in the mornings, always slow and small to start off with progressive movements as opposed to going right off the bat into a large range of motion. I call this the oscillatory, the vibrational movement that we were talking about. Tucking the chin, or the, I should say the face back very gently, this will recruit all the levels of the cervical spine and gentle what I call no-nos, like you're telling a small child, mm -mm, no, 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 no. But we're all here saying yes today, of course. So no, no, and just breathing here. And what this oscillatory movement gives us a chance to do is just move gently the discs and the facet joints without disruption. So if you have a stiff neck within that small range of motion, just by moving it in these small oscillatory patterns or movements can be very releasing. And then you can slow it down with your breath. Once you warm up a little bit, you can inhale and rotate the neck to one side and then exhale coming back. You can go to the opposite side, inhaling and rotate and exhale, come back. I use these type of oscillatory motions, even with a stiff shoulder, a stiff knee. That's what we can do in our therapy practice. And just a little FYI for you, now you know what you can do with stiff tissues. With a gentle inhale, again, we'll take in a large, long breath, inhaling, expanding. You can roll the eyes up if you wish, and exhale just to relax. Now we'll start moving the shoulders. So as you can see, we're moving proximally. I opened up the neck first because the end points where the lymphatic system dumps its fluid into the venous system has now been opened up. We've created a nice suction effect to pull the lymphatic fluid to the end points towards the secular system. Everything else now will follow from the whole body. Let's start moving our shoulders. A favorite move that you can do, and again, be comfortable if your legs have to be moved apart slightly to accommodate space for your belly, feel free to do so. Hands can be on the thighs or holding the belly, but what we'll be doing is we'll expand our body, rolling the shoulders, and the key here with shoulder rolls is a lot of people think you have to shrug the shoulders. Upper trap is also oftentimes already pretty tight. Allow yourself to fully more concentrate on retracting the shoulders and pulling the shoulder blades down. So it's shoulder blades squeezing, opening the chest, expand this fascia also with the breath. You can roll the eyes up if you wish and relax and come down. In the evening, again, we do not roll our eyes up. We want to settle in. So you don't have to do rolling of the eyes, otherwise you probably will be ready to work all night. So, but it works. I make my girls do this when they're tired of their homework. Inhaling here and then exhaling to relax. Now we can get a little more movement as we inhale. I'll give you another side view from here. And I can even stand up and show you what I'm doing. When I'm inhaling, I allow myself to arc the back gently so it creates a big opening of the frontal line of the body. So I pretend I have a zipper right from my pubis all the way to the top of my head. And as I inhale, I arc the back again, respecting the range of motion that you have. And when I exhale, I may round the back and fall forward, allowing a gentle stretch in the back of the neck. Inhaling and expanding. And exhaling forward and to relax. From here, after your shoulder rolls, again, check in. I've, I've moved, so I'm just adjusting my feet. We can start doing a little hula hoop. Now let's get a little, we've got twists going here. So figure it out, feel it through, start small we'll all look a little different, okay? Because of the available range that we may each have. In this case, I want everyone to pay attention to how their low back feels and their SI joint. Some of us are hypermobile in the SI joint. So I have to be very careful with this movement. So I don't move aggressively in this motion, but I allow swirling, and often I'll use, um, um, I'll compare it to scraping a bowl of chocolate icing on the inside of the bowl and you're the spatula. And you're just going around and scraping that chocolate icing back into the middle of the bowl. Now let's go the other direction too. We gotta get all of it so we have to go the other way. And with the breath, again, anytime that you come forward and you open up, inhale, 
And as you come back down, exhale. Now that we've warmed up some of the tissue of the trunk and you've been flowing and moving, let's do a gentle side bend. So here you can actually even let the hands drop if you wish, so you create a little gentle gravitational stretch. Tuck in the chin again, the reason being just to allow the whole recruitment of the cervical spine, okay? And what you'll see here is we'll, we'll get our side bend leading with the head. So just follow where we'll inhale and we're just allowing the weight of our head to pull ourselves very gently and a very gentle opening of the neck here. Let's just get the movement first. Exhale as we come back, just to get the movement. Inhale, you can roll the eyes up with this one as well as you stretch and exhale and come back. So again, I said that we don't move in planes like a robot. We flow in rotation. So from here, you can inhale and roll the shoulder and the face back gently if you wish. Exhale, come back. And when you come back, I'll show you with the next repetition. Inhale, rolling the chin upwards and the shoulder back gently. When you exhale this time, pull your belly in to make external oblique to bring yourself back. Now we're going to start working some of those postural muscles now. We have already, but here the belly, I'm giving you a little focus. Inhaling and then exhale, pull the side muscle, external oblique to bring you back. Another inhale, turning, and then exhaling to release. Refresh yourself with another deep breath, inhaling here. And just let go. At this time, you can be reflective. We'll move on to the legs. With this type of practice, and now that your mind has become more centered, it's an ideal time to set your intention for the day or create an affirmation for yourself. You are already on this earth because you are here to receive love. Your entire reason for being here is to be with love. That's it. You are a human being. You just be. Be who you are. You're not a human doing. We sometimes get caught up with all the everyday aspects of our lives, all the details, understandably. But at this very moment, take that moment to acknowledge that you are already whole, complete. Honor yourself. And at this time, take a breath in and just thank yourself. And as you exhale, exude that gratitude to all of those around you, be it your family, be it the person next to you, be it your pet. Another inhale to just think and absorb what we can be so grateful for. And exhale with relief and a thought of just surrender. Be receiving for all the beauty that is absolutely yours to enjoy. From here, we'll bring ourselves back, allowing ourselves to open up the legs now. We'll go addressing the lower extremities. If you have to make a little more space, feel free. Creating space with the belly and hugging the belly as you need to. I've opened up the legs wide. From here, again, I'm working my way down proximal to distal. So allowing myself to lift my belly, either with my hands or with my own postural ability, lengthening my spine and my body. I'm going to inhale first. When I exhale, I'm actually going to stabilize by pulling my belly in and trying to lift that knee up. For those of us that feel like we have to bring our knees in, might be slightly strenuous on that low back, bring the knees in and continue to stabilize. So we actually inhale before we start. Exhale, there is a flexion moment here. And you can even curl the spine if you wish. Inhaling, expansion, and then exhaling. You can do one leg at a time or do a marching type of moment. But with the marching, you may be shifting your weight. So depending what feels good for you, Decide if you want to do one leg at a time or both alternating legs. Continue to go ahead with your breath.
Now let's cleanse a little bit, detox a little bit. Inhaling in a regular stance. Exhale, push that air out. Inhale again and exhale, fog the mirror. Inhale again, increase the speed just gently. And another inhale. Good. Relax and release. We've worked our history. Yes. From here, you can settle in because what we'll do next is attempt to extend the legs. So just find your comfort zone again. So I'm extending my knee. Knee extension quadriceps work. Again, the whole point is to incorporate tall body. Holding onto the chair or the chair back can also create an expansion of the chest, excuse me. And so if we're holding onto the back of the chair, you can allow yourself for an expansion. And when you inhale, lift out, tall body you're getting a deep stretch of the backs of the legs. Exhale. One leg at a time if you wish. Usually three counts for this purpose here today. And then an inhaling. And then this is an important one to do when we're doing a lot of sitting. You can do this also in a standing moment as well if you wish. But in the purpose of the session today, we'll do it in sitting. From here now, we'll just work. If you can't see me, my feet are on the floor and I'm just heels, I'm rocking my heels and my toes. So heel lifts, inhaling and exhaling. In this case, because we are um, sitting, it's not really significant which way we breathe with which movement. Just allow for breath to go with your flow. Inhaling here to relax after we've done our feet and exhaling. From here, we're going to go ahead and just start working our limbs and our arms. So as we press our palms together, just open up the fingers and just twist them to get that twist and that flow going. As we inhale, soft arms. You have a neighbor next to you, so be cognizant of your neighbor and just keep your elbows soft and low. So the first arm raise that we're doing right now, we've warmed up the limbs and the, and the uh, torso, and then come and scoop down placing the hands to heart center. So an inhaling breath to lift up. And remember that exotic twist I was telling you about. Allow the fingers to flow. You can move your body. You can come on down and just twist and open up the thumbs and the fingers. There's nothing right or wrong here. Joining the hands if you wish, either open fingers or closed fingers. Pressing and inhaling. And look at my chest in expansion. I inhale and this time I'm actually pulling my belly in to assist with the breath to give myself that postural lift. And then as I exhale, I just expand. I can even move forward now. There's different planes of motion. We can go into the front. We can even go from the outside and sweep upwards, inhaling, leading with the wrists of the hand. I call this painting the wall. Exhale, sprinkling your fingers or painting the wall, whichever works for you, and stretching out. And then one more. Expansion, inhaling, a diagonal movement into a letter V if you wish. Elbows can be soft. This is more comfortable for your arms. And then exhale, stretch the wrist if you can. Move and flow. Nothing right or wrong here. Comfort zone is very important. As we allow ourselves to come to the conclusion of our practice, come into a soft holding of the palms here. Hands to heart center, Anjali Mutra. Just helps us to center and ground ourselves gently. Staying in our realm as we deeply inhale. The eyes can be open or closed, but this is truly your time again to just be introspective. Inhaling and exhaling to relax. After approximately three inhales and exhales, place the palms keep them together and start rubbing the palms together to generate heat like we did earlier. As we generate the heat, take a deep inhale and place these nice soft palms over the eyes and the fingers are gently sitting on the skin of the forehead. Inhale, stretch the skin of the forehead upwards. Exhale, just release the skin but remain in contact, palms to eyes. Inhale again, lifting the skin creating a gentle sinus opening, frontal sinus. Exhale, a gentle return. And then one more inhale. Most of the things are in threes. Inhaling, lifting the skin. 
Exhaling, returning to neutral. <sighs> Inhale, placing the hands of the heart center. At this time, you can set your intention or just let the thoughts move freely through you. Breathing deeply, finding a sense of peace, calm, requesting for serenity, sometimes it's hard to find. You are allowed all the feelings that flow to you, through you, and move on away from you. They're just feelings but honor them, they're there to teach us. You are whole and complete, and the beauty in you is reflected out to all others. May the goodness and the beauty that is in my heart, it honors you and the beauty and the goodness that's in you. Thank you for your practice. I'm going to turn the music down here. <laughs> the last few slides, we're finishing up for our break now. I just have a few slides for you that you can and I'll turn the music back on too. I think it was nice. Um, the references I have for my presentation are, are also available in my presentation, but what I wanted you to have were some just helpful resources. If you wish, you can take a photograph. Um, I always try to have scientific articles, um, try to have some books. Um, I will point out once you, if you feel free, you can take a photograph of this if you wish. Um, and you'll start to discover there's so much out there, <laughs> it's hard sometimes to, to navigate your way through. But um, I'll, I'll switch the slide to show you that the book that's called Yoga for Bigger Bodies, when I was doing my search, um, I got the chance to look at it and open it up, and I really appreciated, um, oh, excuse me, it's not the book, it's the video. When I Google searched Yoga for Bigger Bodies, um, there were some amazing, YouTube videos that are out there. Um, start slow. A guided practice does not necessarily mean that you have to go to a studio, does not mean you have to spend a lot of money. Um, in your community, there may be also um, free access um, to a lot of these types of exercise programs. But when you go on something like YouTube, it's a gift, right? But there's also, it can be very inundating. But you can zone in. I found there was a, a video um, by a young lady who's in Round Rock, Texas. She has a studio there. And she was just so beautiful and lovely. And her, uh, she was so enveloping in her own body and she was conveying her uh, practice in a very gentle way. So again, the gentle form of yoga is, is inclusive for all. And so what I learned when I was doing my search for doing yoga for bigger bodies, highly inclusive for everyone. So I actually prefer, you know, actually utilizing a lot of their resources. The next slide, um, this is the book I was talking about. I, I found that the book by Megan Garcia, the first one that's written there, she is so knowledgeable. She put a lovely book together with colored pictures and just made it so easy and, um, to follow. And she has a lot of the principles and the history of the yoga included in there and the breath work also. So if everyone's okay with that photograph. Um, the audio CDs, oh, there's so many out there. I, you can feel inundated sometimes, too. But some of the bigger names, like Wayne Dyer, Louise Hayes. Um, Louise Hay was more than a pioneer when it came to the healing of the whole body and mind. And the Chopra Center has great guided meditations, free online if you go to their website. And um, Deepak Chopra, I mean, he, he's... He really has brought the science behind a lot of the practices that we do today. So that's why I like a lot of what he represents. So again, thank you. You're welcome to ask me for the copy of my presentation. And I really enjoyed this morning. Thank you for being here. Oh, and thank you, Catherine. <laughs> thank you so much, Catherine. We're going to take a 15, oh, 
will resume at 9.15.